Welcome once again, everybody, to another episode of the Idea Me Show, the show that profiles humans behind big ideas that are shaping our world, inspiring future trends and future creators, and for all those that like really great stories. Uh, I'm Ira Pastor, your life sciences ambassador, along for the journey today. So um, according to the, the World Prison Population List, which gives details of the number of prisoners uh, that are held throughout prison systems uh, throughout the globe, in 2018, there were close to 11 million people uh, held in penal institutions throughout the world. Uh, about half of those uh, represented by the US, China, Brazil, Russia, and India. About a quarter of them represented by the United States alone. Interestingly, a few decades ago, going back to the 1960s, the country of Finland uh, had one of the highest rates of imprisonment in Europe uh, until researchers uh, started investigating ultimately how much traditional punishment did to reduce crime. Uh, they found out it didn't do a lot. Uh, over uh, the next few decades, Finland ultimately remade uh, its penal policy uh, and ultimately uh, came into this period of so-called decarceration, uh, leading to one of the lower rates of imprisonment on the continent, uh, and found out the crime didn't increase as a result. Um, they instituted a variety of policies towards reintroduction of, of uh, prisoners into normal life, um, ultimately developing a model known as the open prison, which we'll get into in a little bit, uh, and found that offending rates dropped to only around 20%. Um, we're, we're honored today to be joined by Ms. Pia Puolaka, who is the project manager of a fascinating smart prison project uh, under the Criminal Sanctions Agency of the Central Administration Unit. Uh, the Criminal Sanctions Agency in Finland is responsible for the enforcement of sentences in Finland, and it operates under the direction of the Ministry of Justice and implements a variety of criminal policy by the ministry. Uh, Ms. Puolaka has been working for the Criminal Sanctions Agency since 2012, uh, where she originally started as a prison psychologist uh, and since 2017 she's been working for the central administration uh, where she first worked as a senior specialist responsible for rehabilitative services including program work family work psychological and spiritual counseling services uh, in 2018, she was appointed to the project manager position of the Smart Prison Project. Uh, her current post includes developing digital services uh, for rehabilitative purposes and leading the implementation of the Smart Prison System. Uh, by education, Ms. Pulak is a forensic psychologist. Uh, she also works as a private psychotherapist and hypnotherapist. She has degrees from University of Helsinki uh, and Abdo Academy. Uh, also has done further studies at uh, Alto University in Artificial Intelligence and Digitalization, ultimately uh, to be directed for the purposes of the Smart Prison Project. Uh, that being said, uh, Ms. Pilaka, thank you for taking the time to come on the show today. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's a real I'm pleasure. I'm honored to be here. <laughs> no, it's, a, it's, it's our pleasure to have you. Um, you, know, you know, typically we, we start things off by really just handing the floor to our guests for a little bit to talk about themselves. Uh, if you can just uh, take us a little bit into your background, sort of uh, how you developed an interest in psychology and forensic psychology, psychotherapy, and so forth, and, and a little bit of, of your path to date uh, and how you got involved in this rather fascinating uh, Smart Prisons project. So as you told, uh, I'm a trained uh, psychologist. That's, that's my background, and I started as a prison psychologist. And I think I was interested in criminal behavior since I was a teenager, <laughs> I could say. And then in, in, then in high school in Finland, it's the first opportunity to study psychology and I became interested in it. And then when I was um, studying in the, in the university, we, we, we had a visiting lecturer in criminal psychology. And uh, I became very interested that time and uh, she was looking for a research assistant to her, to her uh, profiling project. So she was profiling criminal behavior. And uh, so I went for this research project and after that I continued, did some further studies in, in forensic psych psychology and, and that, that's how it started. And then in 2012 was, was the first year when I started to work in prison, namely. And, and then this, um, then when I came to central administration, as you told, uh, I was first specialized in rehabilitative uh, practices, as psychologists usually are. 
but then this digitalization project started in, in 2018 and it was very hard for some reason for them to find anyone to be the project manager. And, and I, I kind of saw that this is something mm, for the future, that this might be the next uh, big thing in our field. And, and, and so it was. And even without any previous background in ICT, I, I took the position and, and then I, I learned by doing. I could say, and of course, I have a lot of ICT specialists in my team that that help me since since I'm I'm only a psychologist. But but the good thing is that I've been able to combine this this digital means to rehabilitative purposes, and I think that's that's the real <laughs> the the most important thing that that you can use ICT for these kind of purposes. So that's it. That's my <laughs> that's my story behind well, the project. I, I, I appreciate that background. Um, before we get into um, some of the themes about the Smart Prison Project, I was wondering, especially for you know, because about half of our audience is is over here in the U.S. Uh, and and we are very unfamiliar, let's say, with. Uh, the, the concept of say an open prison uh, and mm. you know, we uh, we understand that uh, you know the research that we're talking about prisoners with with sort of less sentence you know minimal supervision uh, and security uh, prisoners may be allowed to take up employment while serving their sentences walk us through a little bit uh, if you would uh, of just this concept um, for, for some of us that are, are more familiar with, say, the U.S. system, and also maybe a little bit about, um, uh, you know, what types of um, prisoners you may uh, have sort of in such a system, uh, obviously, uh, are, are, we're not talking about all types, uh, if, if you have a, uh, a, a mass murderer or something, is that that's something separate, or what, what is sort of the purview of the open prison system in Finland? Yeah, this open prison system is part of the rehabilitative concept we have. Mm -hmm. So there are two kind of uh, prisoners in open prison to to categorize them very very uh, in a sim in the most simple way. Okay. So some prisoners go directly to open prison if they have a so-called minor sentence they have a very short prison sentence so it's no use to put them in the closed prison actually if you put a low risk prisoner to very high security prison with other prisoners that are very high risk offenders you might ruin ruin their rehabilitation by doing that so uh, for them uh, they they don't need this kind of prison system. They, they are, uh, most often they are uh, people who are very, very uh, addict, they have very uh, severe addiction problems, alcohol, drug problems, and, and their criminal behavior is bound to, to their addiction. So they are kind of a, how would I say, survivalist criminals. <laughs> they, might, they might not have such a strong um, psychopathic or criminal thinking uh, mindset but but they are more sick i would say in 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 a in a different way so so these kind of prisoners deserve to be uh, treated in in a rehabilitative way then of course the high risk offenders go first uh, like life sentences they start in the closed in in the closed prison and we we make them we make all prisoners a so called sentence plan so when you go to closed prison, your sentence plan might uh, require you to, uh, for example, consult a psychologist or go to rehabilitative uh, or, or substance uh, abuse um, rehabilitation ward or uh, um, take, a, take a program that, uh, where you learn uh, how, how to get rid of your aggressive behavior and, and your aggressive thinking styles and these kind of things. So I think uh, same kind of rehabilitative programs that you probably have in US prisons. But then it's the idea that little by little, you, you go uh, with little steps towards uh, your, your, free, your freedom. So after you've spent some years in the closed prison, you can apply for more open prison. 
and even in open prisons there might be a little bit different levels so not all open prisons are, are so open than the most open one but that's the idea that when the sentence gets uh, shorter and shorter you little by little uh, start to um, go to more free settings so that the threshold uh, to go to total freedom it's not it won't wouldn't be so um, high that that you first learn to be in a more in a little bit more um, free uh, settings and only after that you are released and we see that this is a way to uh, have an effect on recidivism that you rehabilitate prisoners in this way step by step and in all prisons we have uh, rehabilitative programs and help counselors and, and staff responsible for rehabilitating. So this, this is the basic idea. Thank you, I, I appreciate that background. Um, so moving then from that, you uh, were responsible for authoring a paper that was entitled um, Smart Prison, the, the Preliminary Development Process of Digital Self-Services in Finnish Prisons. Uh, and you talk about how uh, Finnish prisons have become known for this you know, very high quality, uh, stable conditions for prisoners, but you write that uh, over time they had fallen behind a bit in, in sort of what we were seeing in terms of the outside world and, and digitalization and some of these other uh, technologies, the sort of the tech world outside moving very fast, changing. Uh, the world is getting smarter. Uh, we have, you know, concepts of smart cities and smart homes and smart phones. Um, smart prisons uh, is something else that uh, makes sense to uh, feed people back into society at the right level. Can you walk us through a little bit about um, how you first put together this proposal uh, and sort of what was involved in, in pushing it forward in the, in the system for these concepts? Okay, so when the smart prison uh, project started, of course, there was first also people who were against it and saw it as a security threat. But then we had already made the observation that it's true that we are lacking behind in digital development regarding our prisoners' uh, possibilities to use digital services. So compared to many um, other organi organizations and, and uh, clients in civil life like schools and hospitals, prisoners didn't have uh, appropriate access to, to internet or digital services. And, and this is a big risk that you don't know how to use these services. You don't learn the skill to manage your own affairs in a modern society. And of course, um, the variety of services that we can provide inside prison is limited. Not, not all the services of society can, can come physically into the prison. But, but we rely in many ways to services outside society. And that is how it's uh, supposed to be if we want to uh, integrate people back to the society. So also it's about uh, that the, the, the amount of services available increases. And I see this is a potential to have effect once again on the recidivism that, uh, that you can contact, contact outside uh, officials and uh, organizations, social workers, NGOs, and, and, and take care of your take care of your important things even during the prison sentence otherwise you are totally out out of everything and and without without the things that you need to have a, a kind of a crime free life after prison otherwise the new crimes come very fast after the release if you don't have the basics taken care of before you are released like housing or social welfare or a possibility for some some kind of educational or vocational possibilities or um, or any any anyone that could help you with your uh, mental health or substance abuse problems so all these um, all these uh, services uh, should be contacted during the prison sentence already to have a kind of a continuum from prison to, to outside. 
so that's why mm, I think it's a it's a basic right to mm -hmm. have the right to use the services, uh, the digital services from from prison, and we also call it the principle of normality that the prison sentence takes your freedom, but otherwise you should be treated uh, as any other citizen. Prisoners are in a in an in an equal position otherwise compared to other citizens of the society. So that's important. Absolutely. Uh, you, know, you mentioned early on how, you know, obviously you have a background training in, in, uh, in psychology and psychotherapy and hypnotherapy, but you had obviously to take your time to learn um, sort of AI and, and digitization and some of these, these um, techniques. Can you, um, can you just talk about some of the uh, interesting programs related to uh, maybe a, a couple of examples of interesting things you're seeing as you've implemented some of these tools. Um, obviously, there's a lot in the press that, that, that talk about AI, which is such a, uh, a hot topic nowadays because it's um, mm. in so many industries. I can, I, I'm, I'm from the pharmaceutical industry and AI is very important in, uh, in drug development and things of this nature. Um, but it's everywhere, uh, as is uh, you know, digitalization uh, all around us. Um, any interesting stories, uh, examples of, of things that you have witnessed since you know, you've learned stuff and started teaching uh, to, to, uh, to the various inmates that you might want to talk about? Yeah, well, the first uh, ex experiment that we did was that uh, we opened uh, this kind of online course for prisoners to study basics of AI. And, and this is a famous course uh, done by Helsinki University. Uh, and it, the elements of AI that, is, that has gone all around the world in various countries. And it's, it's the most popular course ever done in the University of Helsinki. So it, it was easy to open to these prisoners joint use uh, workstations. So just to open it there on the whitelisted internet sites. And, and that was the first experiment we did and, and we saw interest and we saw potential. And of course, then when I did the further studies in AI myself, I understood that there's a lot of interesting possibilities to use the data in, in, a, in a more efficient way. And I think AI is for this that uh, our processes in many ways could be more efficient and effective. And, and that's that's the thing, why why it's a good tool for for even even um, human kind of working like the, like the prison's rehabilitative work is. You, you probably understand that there's also controversy and ethical questions that to how um, high extent should we use AI, with, whether there are some risks, but. Uh, uh, for example, in my field in criminal psychology and, and, and in, in the forensics and, and in the field of um, correctional sciences, uh, AI is used, for example, in, in risk assessments and risk management. So prisoner's background <clears throat> information can be analyzed in an automatic way to assess the risk. There are, of course, many controversies and ethical questions in this. Then, of course, security te technique is one, like uh, the scans that uh, read prisoners' uh, faces and can analyze uh, whether something is happening in the prison or not, what, what, what is, uh, what's going on in the prison settings. So in surveillance technique, you can use this. And, uh, but the, what I'm most interested about is that how, how much we can use it for the rehabilitative purposes. So, so can we manage, uh, is, our offender, is there something in our offender management? This, this kind of uh, use of AI has been al already done. So offender assessment and management is oriented by AI, at least to some extent. Of course, uh, it, it, the humans make the decision, but, but they use AI as a tool for their risk assessments and, and management of uh, prisoners with certain uh, background. And I also think, thinking about my background in offender profiling, that this has been done for dec decades, I think, that in offender profiling, uh, you, can, you can use the large data of what kind of criminals typically do certain kind of crimes. Uh, 
And when a new crime happens, you can compare it with the data that you have gathered. So I think AI has been around for, for, for years already, but uh, for some reason this time has uh, taken it to a whole new level. And we start to see that there's probably even more possibilities that we have realized. Very interesting, very interesting. Um, you know, thinking of your, you know, you were just mentioning sort of the, from the, from the profiling perspective, um, obviously, and, and I don't know background, the, I, my, my, my background in this obviously is Hollywood and, and watching movies uh, over the years from things like, you know, Clockwork Orange to uh, Minority Report, uh, where, you know, mm -hmm. so you, you have this dystopian or futuristic perspective on some of this stuff. Um, just as a, you know, just as a side question, uh, as a, someone both now well-versed in technology, but also your background in, in the human mind. Uh, any other interesting um, uh, projects, um, uh, sort of futuristic things that you might be planning, obviously nothing confidential, but other things related to this project that you may be able to talk about, because I think sort of the integration of, of what we're seeing with technology, with your, uh, you know, sort of this, um, uh, understanding of the of the criminal mind or otherwise is is really opens up a, a, a lot of what we see in the movies potentially uh, any interesting things you want to talk about from a looking out uh, five ten years perspective mm. yeah I think in the movies they always want to pick up a theme that represents the kind of worst case scenario where right. uh, where uh, technology is is used for bad and questionable purposes to de destroy people's lives and and on purpose treat people in, in an unequal way <laughs> but uh, in in real life there are i can say that at least in in my field we we really try to make our work processes faster more effective more effective and efficient by, by using technology. And I think now that we are opening the first uh, smart prison in, in November, the first, uh, the, the next uh, project is to extend this model to all our closed prisons. So we pilot, pilot it first in, in the new women's prison. And then if we get good results, we, we probably at least we want to extend it to all our units, but that depends on, on many, many, many things, whether it's then possible to do, but I hope it's in the future. And then of course, uh, it's in my interests uh, to be able to use, uh, not, not, we are talking about not only our digitalization strategy, but our data and digitalization strategy that includes the use of data and use of artificial intelligence uh, to help us manage and assess our, our uh, prisoners. And, and also, is there uh, anything that we can use in the probations side? So mm -hmm. we call it smart probations. This might be another topic. And of course, I, I see the most important uh, substance in the digitalization is the educational side, so digital skills, these special courses that we have and, and many, many education also in civil life, it happens already online in many ways, not, not only because of this special circumstances of COVID-19, but, but uh, also in, in many other ways, uh, the, the access to uh, studies and, and vocational life, life uh, depends also on digital, digital possibilities. And, and online courses, online platforms, and uh, this is this is one of the services we we try to provide through these uh, smart devices. And the other one is is the uh, how would I say traditional rehabilitation, so uh, consultation of uh, of our organizations that help with psychosocial uh, problems. And there's already a lot going on. There's online therapies, there's even online hypnotherapies, there's online uh, substance abuse work. And there are many, uh, to say, um, self-help programs that you can do by yourself also. So this self-rehabilitation is also one theme 
that might be uh, the low, the lowest threshold to go that you start from something like that that you can do independently and 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 and, and from your own needs and, and and maybe that motivates you to then go further but i see all these free online courses and programs that many organizations provide as a very valuable um, way to start the rehabilitation and, and of course if there are special circumstances like prison prison world is is like COVID-19 every day because you cannot go anywhere that's like a that's a real lockdown when you are in prison actually and I think we've all now tasted a little bit that reality during these hard times but that's how it is uh, and and just remember that at least in those circumstances how much you just need to rely on the digital world and the online contacts without them that's like nothing then it's a total prison if, if you don't have that access that has been proven <laughs> this year mm. absolutely yeah, that's an excellent point um you know you, you, as you're mentioning um, sort of moving from the the initial project to obviously throughout Finland and the different correctional facilities. I was just wondering, I don't know how much you have a chance to uh, travel and sort of lecture uh, outside of Finland on this topic, but um, have you uh, met any, whether it's uh, from the United States or some of these other countries that have a very high uh, incarceration uh, absolute number and rate, uh, any interesting uh, connections you're making on the international scene where people are uh, want to sort of tap your <laughs> tap your mind on how potentially the smart prison model could be applied in other systems yeah we have international organizations uh, international corrections and, and and prisons association I, icpa is is one of uh, one of the uh, top organizations in this field and then also europris the European prison, prisons and probations. So these international contacts are the ones that I've been in, involved with. Last year, there were still live seminars. Now they've been mostly webinars, but, but we stay in contact all the time because this special situation has affected prisons too. But uh, considering my project, this special year has given extra motivation for this, for all digital projects. So there's something good <laughs> in this situation regarding, depending on what you're interested in, but, but since my project is a digital project, it has been a benefit to us in a way. And, and yes, we have international uh, contacts. And I know that in, in other European prisons, there, there is smart prisons, there are smart systems, there are markets for these kind of products for prisons, for especially prisons. So that's a business of its own, how to build these kind of systems in special settings like prison, because the security questions and everything like this is very special. Not everybody can, can come and make things like this in prison. You have to specialize in it to know what, what are the needs uh, and the restrictions where you have to operate. So prison, prison technique, telephone, video conferences, smart systems, ICT solutions, drones, <laughs> everything. Um, that's, a, that's a field of its own. And, and, and all these organizations I mentioned have uh, their own technology uh, sections too. So ICT in, in prisons is a special field of its own already. So yes, um, we have contacts and there are uh, specialists already in this field. Excellent, excellent. Um, you know, Pia, coming back to you, um, anyway, we, we typically ask a, a wrap up question on the show um, about uh, important mentors and influencers in your career so far. Obviously, um, You've, you've had the opportunity to probably meet a lot of folks in academia and, and, and through the, um, the central administration and, and, and working in the prisons and so forth. Um, any specific folks, people that would you'd like to mention at this point that have been very instrumental in your uh, development and, and your continued uh, path along uh, leading these projects in Finland? 
There are probably many. I've had uh, some excellent teachers during my, my years of studying uh, psychology uh, in Finland. Uh, Helena Häkkänen uh, was one of the pioneers of forensic uh, psychology. So I, I want to mention her as one of the first uh, um, important influence, influencers in, in my career. Then, of course, in the prison system, uh, I've met many specialists. I really value the I, the ICT specialists we have, and uh, and and our own uh, chief of ICT services, uh, Riku Pammo, who has been involved in this project and has supported it from the beginning. And then, of course, uh, I've met uh, international uh, influencers and, and people uh, who have been in the smart prison system years before me. And, and I guess one of them is uh, Steven van der Steen from ICPA. I want to mention him, him too. And he's an academic and has uh, written articles about the digitalization of prisons uh, together with Victoria Knight from, from uh, UK. So I think these two academics are, are, are the ones that uh, I've learned a lot from them. And then of course, all the colleagues during these years. Uh, and uh, uh, I remember good uh, prison directors, how uh, it's not an easy job to lead a prison. You have, a, you have to have a strong uh, moral uh, values. You have to know what you're doing and, and be an example to prisoners. And then I also see prisoners as my very uh, important influencers. So um, we, we like to see the, the stereotypes of prisoners from movies. But uh, in, in all persons, there are many sides. And I've met some, some really interesting insights from prisoners, how they see life and what they can teach you about human uh, mind, human nature, life, the difficulties of life, and also the kind of miracle that you can really survive from, from the most, I don't know, horrible experiences. Many prisoners have very traumatic backgrounds, that's for sure, and their problems have started very early. So there's a reason for everything, even, even for the most horrible crimes there's a background and there's a, there are reasons and as a psychologist i see myself kind of a privilege that i will get this window to somebody's mind to really understand what happens and that's the interesting part of being a psychologist for sure Absolutely. Absolutely. Sounds like it sounds fascinating and uh, mm. really moving forward, wishing, wishing you the best with this project and its rollout because it, uh, it, it, it seems like a, a model for uh, to really change things uh, because the way that we've been doing things for, for the last hundreds of years on this front. So real, really mm -hmm. very, very impressive. Um, for um, everybody that's going to be watching uh, this particular episode on the YouTube channel or listening uh, across the various podcast networks, uh, you've been listening to Ms. Pia Pualaka, uh, forensic psychologist, psychotherapist, hypnotherapist, uh, and project manager of the, the fascinating Smart Prisons Project uh, at the, the Criminal Sanctions Agency of the Central Administration Unit uh, in Helsinki. Um, Pia, it's been really a, a pleasure meeting you, um, listening to your story and, and everything you're doing, wishing you the best with it. And uh, as we say, thank you for uh, moving the, the human story forward a little bit. Uh, this has been really eye-opening and, 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 and a wonderful time hearing your uh, hearing all about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for this opportunity to share my ideas. And I, and I hope the ones who listen to this will get something from it. Really? Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Mm.